Father God, we just humble ourselves and just take a deep breath, Lord, and just thank you for this very moment. Thank you for the breath that you put into our lungs, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here this evening to be able to come and learn and fellowship, Lord, and just be educated about what's going on in the world today and just becoming um, clearer, Lord, so that we can continue to walk in love and power and not fear. And so, Father God, we pray and thanksgiving for our guest speaker tonight, Lord. We just pray that you give her a spirit of boldness and a spirit of excitement as she is. I'm sure she is so prepared, and we just thank you for her uh, willingness to spend time with us tonight, Lord, and we just hope that everything we do this evening edifies you and lifts you up, God. We just thank you for this opportunity. So we pray all this in the mighty and sufficient name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. We have Professor Nazi Pakpour with us tonight. She's an assistant professor in the biology department at Cal State University. She graduated from UC Davis with a degree in entomology and she completed her PhD in microbiology, virology, and parasitology at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Packford teaches microbiology, medical microbiology, and racism in the biomedical sciences at CSU East Bay. Her research is broadly focused on the impact of type 2 diabetes on the transmission of malaria parasites by mosquitoes. Professor Packport cares deeply about increasing diversity in the sciences and is always looking for ways to be more culturally inclusive in the classroom. She also runs the CSU East Bay Traveling Insect Petting Zoo and is founder of the annual CSU East Bay Hack Day. For more information, you guys can check out our website, www.packportlab.com. But without further ado, Professor Packport, thank you for sharing your time with us this evening. Thank you for having me and for the introduction and for everybody coming out in a Wednesday evening in a pandemic. I feel like anytime people join in anywhere, it's worthy of celebration. Given the versions of this talk, wherever will have me, but I'm super open to questions. I'm happy to pause and answer them. I'm not always good at keeping track of the chat, but I'm going to try my best to do that. And uh, whenever I speak, I just like to um, acknowledge the Ohlone and Chichonio tribes, I always mispronounce that, uh, upon whose land my university sits before I start. Um, so my contact information is there. You feel free to email me if you have questions to follow up with this. I try to be as accessible as possible. So why am I here talking to you besides the nice invitation that I got? Um, so. I believe in the power of education. I think the more informed we are, the better choices we can make for ourselves, for our communities, for our families. Um, obviously, I'm a professor. It would be a terrible professor if I didn't believe in the power of education. Um, so that's number one. Number two for me is that I value the people in my community. I want everyone to be as safe and healthy as possible. Um, and I see this as one way that I can give back to the communities that I exist in, um, this very nerdy, you know, microbiology side of me has suddenly become more valuable than it was a few years ago. Um, and so I'm trying to put that to use. Um, and lastly, viruses know no borders or boundaries. So I think the only way that we're gonna find our way out of this pandemic is if we work together across all avenues of work and life. Um, and then I just wanna say this part uh, because this has come up before. Um, I get a salary as a professor from the state of California, but um, I'm doing this outside as my own time on a volunteer basis. I'm not funded by any other organizations or companies. Um, this is knowledge that I have through my background and practice um, that I'm sharing and trying to make available to others. Okay. I thought I would start by just reminding us kind of snapshot where we are um, in the pandemic. And as much as possible, I'm gonna to try to give links to everything that I'm showing or talking about. So if you're nerdy like me and you wanna dig into it further, um, should be easy to do. Uh, I'll share the slide deck as well so you guys can have access to that. So nationally, where we are in terms of cases is we sort of had our post Christmas travel peak. We're starting to come down um, which is really great, but we're still nowhere near low enough um, to 
be really limiting the number of deaths that we have. And we're almost at half a million deaths within the United States from COVID. Um, right now, on average, about 3,000 Americans are dying every day. Um, and what's not accounted for in this data, and which I saw a lot of questions from the pre-questions that I saw, is really what happens to people once they're infected from if they recover from severe COVID or what happens to them if they have a mild COVID infection. And we'll dig into that. But what you often don't see represented in these numbers is everybody really focuses on the deaths. But there is another toll that this is taking on us as a nation in terms of our health that's everything bad that happens to you short of dying, which you know can't be easily graphed like this. Where are the cases nationally? The darker the red, the more intensely there's transmission in those places and the more people are becoming infected. Uh, it doesn't look good. I mean, this is a bad map of the United States. We really would like to see more areas that are white or are really light yellow. That's not the case. And you can, whoop, sorry. Um, and you can see that California has a pretty uh, high rate of transmission happening. The numbers for California specifically, we saw this huge peak in December and January in terms of number of infections that absolutely had to do with holiday gatherings and travel. Um, you're seeing it come down again. There's another spike anticipated from the Super Bowl and everybody gathering to watch the Super Bowl. So we're expecting another bump up here um, within the next week. Uh, we've almost had 45,000 deaths within California. Uh, 530 people died yesterday from COVID infections. And so just to give you a sense of that number, because I feel like sometimes these numbers are so big that they just sort of go over our heads. Um, that is almost equivalent or approximately equivalent to if you filled every seat within the SF Giants Stadium, that's how many people have died just in California, an entire stadium's worth. Um, so we're not seeing the end of this, and this is pretty serious stuff uh, that we need to talk about. Um, a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you is uh, based on scientific research. Um, and I just wanted to kind of make clear the scientific process because I think this is one of the things that has fueled a lot of the misconceptions um, or distrust of what's coming out. Um, and it's how we do science, particularly science around uh, something that we don't understand. Um, so the way that science works, the way that we work as scientists is we have an idea or a hypothesis. Uh, Well, uh, actually, sorry, uh, it accidentally got you muted, Professor. If you could unmute, my apologies. <laughs> Should I start? Where did I get muted? All right, just you could see the top that idea is nazi. That's okay, when you started. Yep. Um, okay, so we do experiments to test that idea, and then from those experiments, we get data. And if the data fit with the idea or hypothesis we had, that's great, that's confirmation. Then we start to think about that thing as being a fact or being true, and we do build off of it. But a lot of the time, our ideas are incorrect. Our hypothesis is wrong. And if you talk to most scientists, they'll tell you that 99% of what we do is failure. 99% of the time, the ideas and hypotheses we have are incorrect. When that happens, we go back and we refine the idea, we alter it, we develop a new idea or hypothesis, and we run through this cycle until eventually we get an understanding of what's happening. So what kinds of things feed into that hypothesis or that idea or question? Observations from what we're seeing in the world, new data as it's coming in, and new information. This has been particularly true for the COVID-19 pandemic because it is a new virus. There's been this constant putting forth of hypotheses and ideas of what we think is happening, and then the collection of data or observation from things around us, and then a refining or a changing of that idea or of that question. And so everyone has sort of been witness to real-time science happening in the news. And this is what we want. We want conclusions and recommendations to change based on new information that's coming in. But what this means then is that you'll hear someone say something and then two weeks or two months or six months after that, they might say something different because there's a different amount of information and data that is now known that was previously unknown. 
So the sort of change and shift that you might see in scientific communication is a reflection of the new data that's being gathered and the new observations and the new information that's incoming and adjustments are being made based on that new information. We do this all the time, right? Like we, we think something is correct, we get some more information and then we adjust and do differently. Like if you've ever cooked and worked with recipes, you know this intrinsically, right? You get a recipe, you cook it the first time and you're like, ah, you know, I'm gonna tweak this recipe now that I ate it. And I think next time I'm gonna add this or adjust this. Science is really just one big cookbook, I like to say. Okay, that's the process. Let's kind of dig in here. What's an infection? An infection is anything that is caused by a microorganism. Generally, microorganisms, it's right there in the name. They're tiny things that we can't see. Broadly, we put these things in three categories. There's parasites. These things have cells, like we have cells. They can cause diseases like malaria or intestinal worms. There's bacteria. These guys also have cells. They can cause diseases like urinary tract infections, um, food poisoning, strep throat, right? All of these things. And then there's viruses. And viruses don't have a cell, and I'm going to talk about this more, but it's a fundamental difference between viruses and bacteria and parasites and us as humans is that they don't have a cell. They don't have cells. Um, viruses cause things like Zika or West Nile or COVID-19. Now, you guys notice my cool animation? Maybe you need to see it again. Look at me using technology and animations. Um, antibiotics kill bacteria because they are living cells. That's what they interfere with, are the metabolic processes of bacteria. Viruses don't have a cell, and so antibiotics don't work against viruses. I have spent 20 years telling my mother this. She still doesn't believe me. Every time I get sick, she says, why don't you go get antibiotics? And I'm like, mom, it's a viral infection. Like, it's a sinus viral infection. Antibiotics aren't gonna do anything. Uh, okay, so that's number one. Like, if you were wondering why we're just not treating COVID-19 with antibiotics, it's because it only works against bacteria. Viruses are different. Now, how big is a virus? Hopefully you can see this. This is a piece of human hair. Relative to that, this is a piece of beach sand. This is a grain of salt. We come down here, here are individual red blood cells. Here is a respiratory droplet. So as I'm talking, not spit, I'm not talking about you know, what you feel if you're sitting in the front row of my classroom and I'm talking enthusiastically. I'm talking about just what comes out with your breath that you can't see. That's a respiratory droplet. Down here in these little, little blue commas, that's bacteria. There is a particle of wildfire smoke. And then down here, this little red dot is a virus. That's about the size of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. It's really tiny. It's even tinier than a bacteria, which we can't see, even tinier than an individual red blood cell. That is how small it is. And that has a lot to do with the way that it's transmitted is just understanding how tiny it really is. So what's a virus? Viruses, we argue, generally aren't alive because they don't have the ability to make proteins. So everything that you have in your body is made from proteins. The nails you grow, the hair, the skin, the organs, they all are made of proteins. That steak you ate, made out of proteins. That piece of fruit that you had, proteins, to some extent. That's the general term there. And then things that are alive can make energy. We have the ability to make energy, have movement, have metabolism, all that good stuff. Viruses don't have either of these things on their own. They can't make things. And they can't have any, they don't make energy, they don't have any fuel. What do they have? They have what we call a genome, which is RNA or DNA. And I'm gonna explain all of this to you. So if you're like, oh my, I can't understand what she's saying. We're gonna, we're gonna break it down. This is just the first introduction, don't panic. So all viruses have a genome, RNA or DNA. That's the information for how to make stuff. Then around that, they put a little protein coat or capsid, that's to protect the genome. And then some viruses, not all, around that have a membrane. So they can have up to two layers around them. And that's it. That's all viruses have. All viruses have a genome and a protein coat. And then sometimes some viruses get to have this lipid membrane. But that's it. That's their totality of what they have is those three things. 
So just really quick, because I want to make sure we're using the proper terminology. I want everyone to talk like a scientist and not a racist. So we're going to call things what they are. The disease is called coronavirus disease 19, which is abbreviated for COVID-19. The 19 is for the year that it was discovered. It is not the version that it is. This is not uh, operating system 2.3. This stands for coronavirus disease 19 for 2019. The microbe, the thing that causes the disease, is severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, which is abbreviated to SARS-CoV-2. So I am either in this talk going to talk about the virus, in which case I'll be saying SARS-CoV-2, or about the disease, which I'll be saying COVID-19. Um, and we're not gonna be racist and call the virus anything else, because it has a name, it has a technical name, and that's what we're gonna refer to it by. Okay, so what's the structure of a coronavirus? This is a family of viruses that exist. And again, we're gonna dig into this a little bit deeper. I want you to understand the structure of the virus because then you'll understand transmission and why you have to wear masks and how the vaccine works. So all of those pieces are built out of, off of understanding the structure of the virus. Okay, so the genome is made out of positive sense single-stranded RNA. That's the genetic information. Around that is a protein coat or a capsid now I'm showing you this in two dimensional. I'm showing you as a slice of bread, but it's actually a three dimensional shape. So let's just keep that in mind. It's not a flat thing, it's round, but I've taken a slice to show you. Around that is a membrane envelope, which is made of a lipid bilayer, like an oily layer. Embedded in that membrane envelope are protein spikes. You've probably heard about the spike protein a bunch. It's what the vaccine is designed against. So this is the general structure of all coronaviruses, the whole family, not just SARS-CoV-2. They all have an RNA genome. Around that is a little protein coat to protect it. Around that is a little film, oily film that's the membrane. And then embedded in that oily film are the protein spikes. Why are they called coronaviruses? It comes from the Latin corona, which can mean crown or halo, because if you look at a scanning EM microscopic image of them, you can see those spikes, like a little crown or halo around the virus. And so that's where they get their name. It has nothing to do with corona beer, which apparently went down in sales by 30% when the coronavirus pandemic started, because people saw the two names and made the association. So you should feel free to consume things that have corona in the name. It doesn't actually mean it has anything to do with the virus. A lot of what you need to understand about transmission and the vaccine has to do with understanding RNA, DNA, and how proteins are made. I think that can be really confusing if you haven't had biology classes recently. So I'm going to try to describe it in metaphors, which I think is a little bit easier to understand. So in our cells, we have DNA which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is like a giant, massive library of recipes. A recipe to make every single protein, chemical, enzyme in your body is contained within our DNA. And every cell has that library. Within every cell of your body is the information to literally make everything that your body can make. So every cell within it contains like the Library of Congress of recipes. These are the directions for how to make all the things that your body needs. Now your hair cells make one thing and your skin cells make a different thing. But within those cells, they contain all of this information. It would be really inefficient to try to make things. If you wanted a recipe, you would go to the library and you would check out a book, right? You wouldn't take the whole library home with you. And that's what our cells do. So if you check out a recipe book, then you're looking at a gene. A gene is a segment of DNA that has the recipe for how to make a specific protein, right? So we went from, so we have our recipe book, but you might not wanna take your recipe book to the kitchen, right? If you want an individual recipe. So what do you do? Uh, what you would do is copy that recipe book, that recipe that you want for the one particular thing that you want on a piece of paper. Our cells do this, and what we copy the DNA into is RNA. So RNA is like the working recipe for how to make an individual protein or enzyme or whatever it is our cells need to make. So we went from DNA to RNA, 
We went from the Library of Congress of Recipes to an individual recipe book, and then out of that recipe book, we copied out a single recipe. That's what our cells are doing. And then we take that single recipe, that's RNA, and we make something, like pie. That's the protein, the actual stuff that life is made from. This is what our cells are doing constantly. Our cells are going into their little library of Congress of recipes, finding the particular gene that they need to make something, copying out and making RNA, and then turning the RNA, using that recipe to make the actual protein that's needed. All right, so this part where we go from the RNA recipe, the apple pie recipe, to the actual apple pie, that involves a lot of stuff, right? That step involves a lot of stuff. You have to have ingredients, you have to have baking supplies, you have to have an oven. All of that stuff is basically the machinery of our cells. Our cells have all of this stuff inside them that allows them to take a recipe, RNA, and make it into something, a protein, apple pie. This is what our cells are doing all the time. And so what RNA is, is just an individual recipe coming out of the giant library of recipe books that's stored within the nucleus of an individual cell within our body. All of the stuff within the cell is the machinery and goodies and ingredients that allows it to make that protein. Okay. So what does a virus do? A virus says, screw your RNA recipe, I've brought my own. And I'm gonna take over your kitchen. And now what you're gonna make is my recipe and only my recipe, nothing else. No apple pie, no mac and cheese, no pizza, nothing, just what I want. And so you're gonna use my recipe and I'm gonna use your equipment to make what I want, which in my little metaphor here is a blueberry pie of new virus particles. So what the coronavirus is doing, what SARS-CoV-2 is doing, is taking over the machinery of the cells it infects so that it can make more copies of itself. It's taking over the kitchen. And the way it does that is by bringing in its genome, its RNA genome, which is essentially a recipe for how to make more viruses. So that's what's happening when a virus infects our cells. It's co-opting all of the machinery within our cells and saying, you're not gonna make anything else. You're just gonna make more copies of me. So that's what an RNA virus is doing. Okay, so let's dig into those pieces. Um, okay, so nucleic acids, the RNA, is basically a recipe for how to make more virus. This is like my pretend version of how to make more virus. Around that is a protein coat or a capsid. So you can kind of think of this as a recipe box. It's a little box around the recipe. It's a little three-dimensional thing that sits around the RNA and protects it. Right? If you send a little piece of paper out into the world, it's going to get wet, it's going to get damp, it's going to get torn up. The same is true for a single piece of RNA. If you just had a piece of RNA out in the world, it would get degraded and fall apart. Then around that protein coat is the membrane envelope, a lipid bilayer. And so a lipid bilayer is basically like a drop of oil. Like if you think about olive oil in the kitchen, I'm going to stick to my kitchen analogy. Right, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about that's around each individual virus particle. Now an oily layer like that is really delicate. And so the metaphor I'm gonna use for that is like a balloon. Like if you blow up a balloon a lot, right? Any little thing can pop the balloon. Any little thing that touches it, any little thing that cools it or heats it is gonna make it pop. And that membrane envelope surrounding the capsid and the genome of the virus is really, really delicate, which is why soap destroys it. Because what does soap do to oil? If you've ever had an oily pan and you put a drop of soap on it, what does it do? It, it destroys the lipid and the oil, right? That's why hand washing works. It's also why if this virus dries out, it can't infect you. It's why heat works or why drying out any of your masks can kill the virus. As soon as this virus gets dried out, that membrane lipid layer falls apart and it no longer is infectious. It cannot infect you if it's just the protein coat and the RNA. 
It has to have that membrane envelope on the outside. And that membrane envelope is really delicate, for which I am internally grateful, because if it was hardier, we would be really screwed. Okay, so why would the virus evolve to do this? The pro of having that membrane envelope is that it actually allows it to hide from our immune response. And I'll show you this when I show you the life cycle of the, the virus, but it actually gets that membrane envelope, that lipid layer from our cells. It's literally putting the skin of the cell that it was infecting around itself and walking around like a creepy zombie inside our bodies. Well, it's not really walking, but you get the idea. It's taking the skin of the thing that it was infecting and putting it around itself. And because it does that, it's much harder for our body to identify it as a foreign bad guy that needs our immune system to fight it. So that's how it benefits the virus, right? But the way it hurts the virus is that membrane lipid layer is, dries out really quickly, is really delicate, is sensitive to detergents, is sensitive to heat, right? It breaks apart really quickly and easily. So there's kind of pros and cons to having a membrane envelope. All right, the last layer for the virus are these protein spikes. And those spikes are there, and they're always going to be on the outermost layer of the virus, because those are basically the little keys that allow it to attach and get into our cells. Without those spikes to unlock its way into our cells, it can't infect us. So in my bizarre little metaphor that I'm building here, we've got the recipe in a recipe box in a balloon with a set of keys. I mean, I, I'm trying to make it so it's not overwhelming and it's jargon, but that's basically what those spikes are. They're basically the keys that allow the virus to get into us. So what happens once the virus gets into us? So when a virus is outside of a living cell, it's considered inactive. It has no legs, it can't move, it can't communicate, it just goes wherever the environment takes it. Wherever the wind blows it, wherever the, you know, it exists on whatever surface, it doesn't have any agency, it can't do anything. When it's inside a living cell, it's considered active because it's actively replicating itself, right? It showed up with its little recipe and was like, I'm taking over the kitchen, and we're just making more blueberry pie virus particles and that's it. And so it's considered active. A single virus particle is called a viron. A person that's infected with COVID-19 is gonna have millions and millions of virons inside them. So if you're infected, if you have COVID-19 infection, you have millions of virons happening inside you. So that's how we would talk about it. How is it transmitted? We know now that the main majority way that it's transmitted is droplet. Again, I'm not talking about the spit that you feel if someone is enthusiastically talking. I'm talking about every time you breathe out of your lungs, that air is going to have some level of moisture and droplets in it. That's what we're talking about here. So the majority of the transmission is happening between individuals indoors unmasked all of the studies globally have shown that anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of transmission is happening indoors unmasked between individuals that are speaking or in close proximity this is why restaurants movie theaters watching the super bowl all of these things become problematic because if you're spending any amount of time indoors unmasked, then you have a really, really high likelihood of transmission if someone's infected. We now know that it's much less, very, very rare to actually have transmission via contact, touching. And the reason for this is, is that you have to touch virus with your hand and then touch your face. And then that virus has to then get breathed into your lungs. And we know that the amount of virons that it takes to infect someone, so how many virus particles have to get into you, that it's actually a, a pretty high number. And so the chances of you touching enough virus and then touching your face and that virus then getting breathed in is pretty rare. We're not really seeing a lot of contact transmission happening. It's really all about respiratory transmission. So it's pretty rare that we're getting contact transmission. The most rare, is fecal oral 
or as I like to call it, poop to mouth, um, which is basically touching feces that has virus particle in it, getting it on your hands, getting it near your face, and then breathing it in. This was something that we were particularly worried about with parents and parents of young children. If you've been around babies, there's a lot of poop, there's a lot of wiping of poop. And so we do see some level of transmission here, but again, super duper rare. The majority of the transmission, indoors, unmasked, close proximity, droplet transmission. What does droplet transmission look like? So every time you speak, you're putting droplets of moisture into the air. The bigger the droplets are, the more quickly they're going to fall to the ground. The bigger the droplets are, the longer they're going to take to dry out. Remember, this virus can't infect you once it dries out all the way. So if you have a little goldfish in a bubble of water, right, and the water dries up, the goldfish dies. So the bigger the droplet of moisture is, the longer the virus can survive in it, but the bigger the droplet of moisture is, the more quickly gravity will pull it down to the ground. So for example, for Ebola, which is a respiratory virus, those droplets that hold enough virons to infect you drop to the ground within three feet. Those are considered large droplets. Those are, that's the spittle. That's like if you could see my computer right now and all the droplets on it for me talking, that's the large droplets. They're sort of smaller size droplets, aerosol, aerosol or airborne droplets. Those are significantly smaller. Those can travel between three to six feet on average. Measles virus can travel like this. SARS-CoV-2 is actually smaller than these other viruses, and so it can actually travel significantly further, up to 30 feet is what we've seen. So six feet is not some magic number where at six feet some invisible wall goes up and you're perfectly protected. If you're indoors unmasked and six feet apart for long enough, you're gonna get infected if somebody's in the room with you that's infected. It helps to be socially distant, absolutely, but none of the things that I'm gonna talk about are foolproof. It's about layering levels of protection. There isn't one magical thing that's gonna keep you safe. Is it safer to be outdoors versus indoors? Yes. Is it safer to be masked than unmasked? Yes. Is it safer to be more than six feet apart than right in each other's faces? Yes. The safest thing is to do all of those things together. Okay, so I'm going to remind you how tiny we are. Virus is down here, teeny tiny. The next size up here in my image is wildfire smoke. And so the metaphor or analogy that I use in my classes to try to get people to think about this is smoking. Because that's about the size of a particle that we think about. Think about when one person smokes in a room that doesn't have proper ventilation. How long does that smoke sit in the air? That's how long virus is going to sit in the air if somebody who is infected is in the room. Think about how long smoke stays around someone that's outside. Right? It dissipates more quickly, but it also has to do with where you are, right? If you're downwind of someone smoking, you're definitely going hit, to get hit with that smell of smoke, even if they're pretty much further than six feet away from you, right? If the wind's blowing in a different direction, then the smoke is going to move in that direction. And we've actually seen this. There was like one outbreak um, at a dim sum restaurant where they were actually able to trace everybody that got infected and they were all on the air conditioning stream. Like one person was infected at a table here, the air conditioner was here and was blowing across and everyone that was in the air conditioning stream became infected because the virus got blown in the air in that direction. So again, this idea that we can be in a restaurant and just be two feet apart and that's magically gonna get us safe is not true. So what I tell my students is, imagine if the person that you're concerned about was smoking, how far would you have to be to not be able to smell their smoke? That's, that's your frame of reference for how far you need to be from unmasked people to be safe. I hope that makes sense. I mean, I, I'm not particularly keen to, you know, push smoking, but I feel like that's a, intuitively we can imagine that right like we can imagine like if somebody's smoking and like right next to us versus someone smoking like the table next to us or five tables next to us um <laughs> yeah basically we can make a little suit that just has fans that blow air away from you that could potentially work 
Yes, or you could just wear a mask. Um, okay, speaking of masks, uh, I want to talk about the different kinds of masks. So N95 masks are incredible. They're great. They stop everything. Everything going out, everything coming in. They're lovely. They are designed to be disposable. If they have a vent in them, which are called KN95 masks or K95 masks, useless. Don't buy them. If there's a vent in your mask, then it's not a mask. You bought a house with an open window in it. What good is a fence if you cut a hole in it? That's essentially what a vent is doing in a mask. So N95 masks are great, but they are designed with fibers in mind to be disposable. So if you're using them multiple times and the moisture builds in them and then dries out and the moisture builds and dries out, you're gonna lose the efficacy of the mask. I don't know how many times you can wear a mask before it gets less than useful to you and you should throw it out. These aren't numbers that I have in my head. Ideally, in a perfect world, all of our healthcare professionals would have access to N95 masks. And this is what we are at now at a point where they can wear their N95 masks and they throw away their mask at the end of each shift or each time that they need to doff on and on. If you have access and you want to purchase N95 masks, you can, but again, you need to throw them out periodically. You can't just keep reusing them because they're designed with paper and meant to be disposable. So imagine a piece of paper that you get wet and dry and get wet and dry, eventually it'll disintegrate. The same is true here. Surgical masks are excellent at stopping virus from you going into the environment. They're definitely gonna stop you from infecting other people. They're also pretty good at stopping you from becoming infected. So if you can afford it and have access to it, definitely surgical masks are the way to go. Now, surgical masks, depending on what you buy and whether they have the wire or not, are going to sit on our faces differently. And so what you're seeing right now, this recommendation to double mask, um, is because a lot of people have surgical masks that are too big for their faces and they leave gaps here on the side of your face or at the top of your nose. Again, if you build a fence and have holes in it, it's not much of a fence. And so one of the things that the CDC is now recommending is to do this technique. It's called the knot and loop. So you tie a knot on the sides of your surgical mask here, and then you loop it behind your head. And what it does is it holds the mask much tighter to your face so that you lose the space around your nose and the gap right here and the gap underneath. No mask is effective if you pull it off your nose. Your nose and your mouth both go to your lungs. There isn't some magical filtration effect that happens if your mouth is covered and not your nose. You might as well not be wearing a mask. Cover it all or just be honest with yourself and don't wear your mask. So the knot and loop can be really helpful, particularly for children or people that have smaller petite faces who maybe don't eat the same amount of candy as me, this can help you fit the mask properly, right? Cloth masks are better at keeping you from infecting others. They're meh at letting virus into you. So they're helpful. They're definitely better than nothing, but they're nowhere near as effective as a surgical mask. The more layers you have in a cloth mask, the more effective it's gonna be, but the more layers you have in a cloth mask, the harder it is to be, um, to breathe. Face shields are totally useless. And then let me ask you a question about face shield. If you were wearing a face shield and I was smoking, would it stop the smoke from getting to you? Would, you, would a face shield stop you from being able to smell the smoke if I was in a room with you? Absolutely not. So if you can smell the smoke, you can get the virus, right? I mean, it'll stop spittle, like if you're talking to someone that's spitting in your face all the time, but if you're that close to someone, you should probably be wearing a mask. It is possible to get the virus transmitted through the eye, but you have to have like actual spittle that gets into someone's eye. Like you have to have like liquid drop, like liquid, liquid droplets that get into someone's eye. Yeah, I, I think, and I'll show you um, a sh data sheet that I have. I think it's important to wear masks. It's particularly to wear, important to wear masks when you're in those high transmission zones. 
crowded places, indoor spaces, high traffic situations. If you're outside and socially distanced, the, the risk definitely goes down. If you want the lowest amount of risk, then you would still wear your mask when you're outside and socially distant. Because again, someone could have been smoking and then gone inside their house, but that smoke is still in the air. And you wouldn't necessarily know or you wouldn't have seen that person. So it's kind of a density issue, right? Like if you're hiking in the middle of the woods and there isn't someone for miles and miles around, super low risk, right? But if you're in a city or urban environment where tons of people are walking the same path, then it's possible that you can get transmission in the air. So I, you know, nothing when it comes to this virus is going to be 100%. It's really about deciding what risk each of us is comfortable with for ourselves and for our community and then acting on that. So it's, it's going to come down to choices, but I, what I hope for you guys is that it's informed choices, right? If you choose to be outside without a mask when you're walking in the park, then understand a little bit about what the virus transmission is, and then maybe you might make different choices, right? Maybe you'll give people a wider berth when you walk around them, or maybe you'll go to the park at a time of day where it's not as crowded, right? These are all choices that we can make as individuals. Uh, this is a study that I really liked. Um, that broke down how effective the masks were. And you can see all the different types of masks here. And so you can see if you wear an N95 mask, that sucker stops everything. Nothing in, nothing out. A surgical mask is about 95 to 98% effective if, if worn properly, right? If you leave all those gaps around your face, not as much. Then you go to cotton two ply, right? And then you kind of come up the various cotton knitted. Bandana, pretty useless. Only stops about 50% of stuff in and out. Nothing, obviously, is 100%. Fleece is also pretty useless. So it's really about something fitting tightly from your chin to your nose with the sides closed if you're going to wear a mask. And so what the recommendation is right now, because we're getting strains of the virus that's actually really effective at transmission, more better at transmitting than what we've had now, is they're saying, if you have loose surgical masks to put a cloth mask over it or do the loop and knot with your surgical mask so it sits more tightly around your face. And surgical masks, again, are designed to be disposable. So if you're reusing your masks, you're increasing the chances that it won't protect you. You're also increasing the chances that you're accidentally going to disrupt virus that might be on the outside and breathe it. That's why the whole pulling down and up, pulling the mask up and down removes all protection for the mask because if Say I put a bunch of flour on the outside of your mask. You walked by somebody that was infected, your mask stopped it. So now that virus is on the outside of your mask. What would happen to that dust or that flour if you pulled it down? You would disrupt it and breathe it right up your nose, right? So the, the more you pull your mask up and down, the, the more likely it is that you're gonna increase your chances for infection. I'm gonna to get to the immunity piece, Kathy, I promise. It's in here. Um, but if I don't, then stop me and ask about it. Um, okay, so basically, the thing, the way that I've heard this sort of talked about is you can stop transmission by really thinking about the three Cs. Avoid closed spaces with poor ventilation, crowded places with too many people, close contact settings with people that are unmasked. So that's what you wanna do with the three Cs. Obviously, all of us have complicated lives. We can't be 100% perfectly safe and still remain sane and have good mental health and be able to do our jobs. So I really like this graph because it kind of broke things out into what's more low risk and what's, more, what's high risk. Um, and then, you know, you get to decide what level of risk are you willing to take and what level of risk do you need to take to maintain your mental health, to be able to take care of your family, to be able to do your job. Um, but you can see the things that are down here at the highest risk are the things that are indoors and crowded. The gym, amusement parks, concerts, sports stadiums, uh, bars, restaurants, indoors within a church unmasked. All of these things are hubs of transmission, right? And then the risk kind of reduces as you go up, right? And I'm going to share the slides with you so you guys can, can have this and print it out and, you know, make little charts out of it. Do whatever your nerdy hearts desire. Um, let's talk about how the virus gets into our cells. So that was kind of transmission broadly breathing it in. But how are we going to have it come into our, our cells? 
Oh, what is it? Oh, Shane. Uh, what about those tight athletic things runners seem to like? I don't know what you mean by those tight athletic things. Are you I'm assuming you're talking about their masks and not their pants, right? Like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look up, I'll look up the name of them, but they're like, I'll look them up the name. Okay. Um, if you can find the material, it's probably on that um, one slide that had all the different materials of the masks. Um, so it'll be in there. Okay, how does it get into our cells? So I told you it's got these keys, these spike proteins on the outside, right? And those spike proteins are particular for a very specific lock. So this virus with its little key can only open the door that has a very specific lock. That door is the ACE2 receptor, which stands for angiotensin converting enzyme two. I forgot to mention, I'm gonna quiz you at the end. So, you know, I hope you're taking notes. Um, it'll be multiple choice and short answer. And then I'm gonna send it to everyone's family so they know how you did. Um, okay, so AC2 is the receptor that it's used, that's the lock. Infection begins when the virus can unlock and get into a cell, right? So if you do not have that receptor, this virus cannot infect you. It's a lock and key, super specific association. So there's cells in our body that don't express this receptor. They are not going to be able to be infected by this virus. Where, what cells in our body have this receptor? The cells in our lungs, um, in our alveolar epithelial cells, type two cells. Those are the cells that express this receptor at the highest level. This virus has evolved to be a respiratory virus. If it's gonna say, hey, I wanna be transmitted via breathing, then the best thing it can do is infect cells that are involved in the respiratory tract. Yes, kids do have less ACE2 receptors, so they are less likely to get infected. Smokers have higher levels of ACE2 receptors, so they're more likely to become infected. We don't see any differences in terms of gender. Um, we haven't seen any kinds of different drugs that people take that change the levels of ACE2 receptors. Um, and we haven't seen any changes in levels of ACE2 receptor that have to do with obesity. Okay, so that's how it's getting in. It's binding to that very specific receptor, that very specific lock, unlocking itself and getting into the cell, right? And then it gets into us, it sets up infections, and what are the symptoms? So I'm showing you this graph over time, and I'm really broad strokes here, right? Like I can get way more nerdy about this, but I feel like then people can't follow along as well. But if you want at the end to ask me more specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. So normally what happens when you get sick? You start off healthy, you're feeling fine, and then you kind of, eh, I'm not feeling great, I'm a little achy, I get sicker and sicker, I feel terrible, I start to get better, and I'm back to health. Yes, we've all had a cold, we were okay, and then we were not okay, and then we were okay again, right? What's happening in our body is that something has infected us and our body mounts an immune response. And as our immune response gets stronger and stronger and kills the bad guys, we start to see less and less symptoms, right? We have bad guys in our symptom, the immune response shows up and kills them, we start to feel better, which means that the amount of virus in our system is tracks, right? The more virus there is, the more our immune system kicks in, the worse we're starting to feel, right? As our immune system starts to do its job, the virus comes down, our symptoms come down, we feel better. It's, it looks complicated when I put it on a graph, but you guys all know this, right? More virus, more symptoms, more immune response, less virus, less symptoms, less immune response. This is normally what happens every time that you get sick. Something invades you, starts to make you feel bad, your immune system kicks in, kills the bad guys, you feel better. Yes, bad guys go up and come down. Symptoms go up and come down. Immune system goes up and then shuts down once there's no more bad guys to fight it. This is not what happens in COVID-19. COVID-19 has done messed up the whole system. And I'm talking about severe COVID-19, where you're hospitalized COVID-19, not mild infections where you're at home and feel terrible, but the kind that send you to the hospital. What happens in the hospital is you get sick, 
the virus increases, at a certain point, your body starts to control the virus and the virus comes back down. What doesn't happen is the symptoms don't come back down. Even though the virus goes away, the symptoms get worse and worse and worse. Why is that? Because your immune system isn't turning off. Normally when the virus comes down, your immune system should turn off. There's no more bad guys to kill. I killed all the bad guys. I'm gonna go back to my barracks, right, and rest. I'm, the soldiers don't need to be out patrolling. COVID-19 messes with our immune response so that our soldiers, our immune cells are running around killing the wrong things. And so you get symptoms that get worse, but they're a result of our wonky immune system and not actually directly the virus. That's what's happening with severe COVID-19. Is it's our own body destroying ourselves because of how the virus turned it on. Now, normally I would swear at this point and call the virus certain things, but I'm trying to be uh, respectful of the space that I'm in. So I'm just gonna say it's a real jerk, but you can insert your own words there because it's using our own defense mechanism to destroy us. Okay, what does it look like if you've had severe COVID-19? Um, one of the things that we know is that there's a lot of scarring that happens in people's lungs because of that massive inflammatory immune response. And so in healthy lungs, you would see blood architecture that looks like this. Your lungs are there to put oxygen into your blood. So there's lots and lots of capillaries with blood in your lungs so that you can have that gas exchange, oxygen and CO2. When you're really sick with COVID-19, look at how tiny that ar architecture becomes. That's why it's so hard to breathe. You have a ton of liquid in your lungs. Those capillaries that are carrying the blood get destroyed. And so you have a really hard time putting oxygen into your body. What we see is even after people start to get better, that infrastructure doesn't rebuild to the same level that it was in a healthy person. There is permanent lung damage that is happening in people that have severe COVID-19. And sometimes we're seeing it in people that have mild COVID-19. We're also seeing damage to heart tissue. There's a lot of people that get better, get off the ventilator, go home, and then die a, a few weeks or months later from a heart attack. It's not quite understood how this is happening. We think it has to do with that wonky immune system, but these are normal heart tissue muscle fibers. These are the fibers from a heart in someone that had a severe COVID-19. There's a lot that we don't understand about what happens to people who recover from severe COVID-19. And there's a lot we still don't understand about what happens and is happening to people that get mild infections. The bulk of the work right now is about saving lives and the bulk of the research has been about vaccine, drug development, and getting people to survive. Just in the last, I would say three or four months, have I started to see data and publications looking to see what happens to people six months out or a year out after infection. Which makes sense, right? We haven't had this virus with us for that long. So how would we know what a one year infection, what, what it looks like one year after infection? if really most people became infected in January and February or March of last year. People are not dying of other illnesses. People are dying from long-term damage caused by this illness. So the virus is permanently damaging people's lungs and hearts, fraying those muscles or those tissues so that they give out much easier. So the way I heard it described is like, it's as if they took the heart muscle of a 40 year old and made it the heart muscle of like a 70 year old. That's what the virus is doing. So you could say that person died from a heart attack, but they would not have died from a heart attack if they had not been infected with COVID-19. So I wouldn't say that they're dying from other illnesses. I would say they're dying from the long-term effects of COVID-19. But this is one of those areas where I make the point about, you know, that you're gonna see what's coming out in the news changing and shifting and a lot more information coming out because there's a lot of long-term studies where data was being collected that are just now that data is coming together because 
people were getting infected in spring of 2020, right? So it's like, how would we know the long-term effects of something if we did, hadn't actually had eight months to wait to collect the data to see what happened? So I anticipate that you're gonna get more and more news stories about this stuff within the next year as scientists collect the data and start to build a picture of what's happening. Um, but I don't have a ton of slides on it because it's, it's a, it's really is a lot of information coming out and not very definitive conclusions. If you ask people that are in this field right now, they'll say, we don't know, we're trying to figure it out. Um, how am I on time? Ooh, I'm already over time, aren't I? <laughs> Should I keep going? Should I pause for questions? What is it that you'd like me to do? So we could take a, take a second um, we did have some questions that folks um, shared ahead of time, but yes. let me ask how much, how much more time would you like in terms of your slides? Because I, everybody I can tell is on the edge of their seats and they're asking for the slide deck and things of that nature. Okay. So. Um, so let me pause and drop the slide deck because I could at least do that. Um. So that's the link to the slide deck. Um, I think I have maybe 20 more slides, but I go through them. I could go through them pretty quickly. There's a few I can skip to. I don't know. Yeah, no worries. I would say that let's continue your flow and, and finish. If folks have to, to jump off, that's okay. We are recording and we um, will have, you know, this will replay on Facebook. So Okay. You know, I would I would say let's go ahead and complete your work and and um, we can go from there. All righty. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, where the viruses came from and where coronaviruses came from. Um, so coronaviruses are actually a large family of viruses that we've known about and researched for um, 80 years. Um, and they can cause illnesses ranging from the common cold to obviously more um, severe diseases. Uh, Sonia, I see your question. Um, they may have unknown damages. I would say right now it's not really clear what the long-term effects of mild infection are. Um, I'm seeing a lot of papers that are coming out from different research groups, but there hasn't been a consensus that's been reached yet. Um, we know of eight coronaviruses that can infect humans. There's the two newer human coronaviruses, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, and then there's Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome 1, and now Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome 2. Coronaviruses in general are um, what are called zoonotic, which means that they're coming from animals and infecting people. And generally in their animal hosts, they cause very cold-like symptoms. But when they cross over into us, they tend to be more severe. So SARS-CoV-1 was transmitted from bats to civet cats, which I didn't know what that was, so that's why there's a picture of it, and then to humans. MERS uh, came from camels to humans, and SARS-CoV-2 is thought to come from a recombination event between bats and pangolins, and then to humans. Um, so what do we think happened? So basically, there was a SARS virus, that was causing a cold in a pangolin, in the pangolin population. They would get colds, it would get better, it lived in pangolins. Then there was a SARS virus that was in bats, and the bats would get colds and they would get better. Now generally, bats and pangolins aren't really hanging out together in the wild, right? Pangolins live our daytime, they live outdoors, bats are nocturnal, they rest on top of high level, like they're not things that are cuddling and making little, you know, TikTok videos together. Humans brought these two animals into contact with each other. So there was a pangolin with a cold and a bat with a cold and they were ended up in close proximity to each other. Imagine them in like two cages next to each other. They sneezed on each other. What happened is that pangolin ended up getting infected with the bat virus. So then that pangolin had its original pangolin SARS virus and the bat virus in it. So then what you got was those two viruses mixing together to make a third virus that was a mixture of the two. How do we know this? We sequence the genome of the virus and we have sequences of SARS viruses and pangolins and bats going back 20 years. And so we compared the RNA that was in the virus of SARS-CoV-2 to pangolin and bats. 
And what we found was that that virus is about, I want to say, 94% pangolin and 6% bat. And so it was a very odd, unique crossover event that happened. And that happened specifically because of human intervention, not mad scientists in a lab designing bioterrorism but the kind of human intervention that happens when we go into the wild and start destroying natural habitats and bringing wild animals into urban environments. So that's where the virus came from, it's from bats and pangolins. And again, the genome of the virus has been sequenced, the genome of, of at this point, I think there's over 100,000 genomes of SARS-CoV-2 that have been sequenced. So we know this virus pretty intimately at this point. One of the other, questions that I get, I'm kind of trying to jump through different questions that, that have come up, um, is about how long the virus lasts on surfaces. People are really concerned about surfaces, especially if you have to take public transportation or be in shared spaces. Um, so this was a study that was done in a lab. Again, I have the links to all of this stuff. They basically put SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1 on different surfaces, and then they looked in, to see how long they could detect infectious virus. Up here are aerosol virus, right? Like what we breathe. They could detect infectious virus that was in the air for three hours after it had been placed in the air. This is normal room temperature, no airflow. So an indoor temperature controlled environment, which makes sense. This is a respiratory virus. This is how it's transmitted. Copper goes away really quickly. Cardboard takes about eight to 24 hours for the virus to dry out and not be infectious. Stainless steel, 24 to 48 hours. Plastic, a little bit longer. Um, however, just because the virus is there doesn't necessarily mean that it can get into your respiratory tract and infect you. We talked about that, right? Contact transmission is really unlikely because you have to get so much virus on your hand and then you got to sniff your fingers or lick your fingers and get it into your respiratory tract at a high level. So generally contact transmission is fairly unlikely. Um, like I'm not spraying down my groceries, right? But I do like ethanol my hands, right? I do hand sanitize my hands after I go grocery shopping. Um, we're, I'm getting to the vaccine. Um, okay, the other thing that makes this virus uh, so deadly and so good at transmitting is this issue of being asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. Okay, so normally, you get symptoms and you get better, right? And if you have a viral infection, the virus tracks with your symptoms. So when you're feeling the worst, you are breathing out the most virus. And when you're feeling the best, you're breathing out the least amount of virus. So if you don't have symptoms and you're out in the world, you're probably not infecting people. This is what normally is happening. SARS-CoV-2 is a jerk. Sometimes it's really hard for me not to swear. Um, because in the beginning, you don't have a lot of symptoms. So even after you're infected, you have a period of time where you're referred to as being pre-symptomatic. You're going to get sick. You're going to have symptoms. You are infected, but you haven't, you're not showing your symptoms yet. It's hidden. But, and this is the real like crux of it, during that period where you don't have symptoms, you're actually shedding a lot of virus into the environment. And this is where we're getting the bulk of transmission is not from people who are feeling sick. Those people are actually staying home generally. It's from the people who are going to be sick, who feel perfectly fine and don't think that they need to wear a mask and go out into the world and are shedding virus. And two or three or four days later, they develop symptoms. But of course, by then it's too late, right? There's been two or three or four days of them being out in the world shedding virus. So this period right here, this pre-symptomatic period, is why it's recommended that everyone wears masks, regardless of how they're feeling. It's why we recommend being socially distant, regardless of how you're feeling. Because you could feel fine and still be infectious. Right? And I'm just, that term pre-symptomatic refers to this period in yellow, where you're infected and you're going to be sick, but you're still not showing symptoms yet. 
So that's, that's really, uh, um, Gail, about the conditions. I just saw your question. Yes, you're absolutely right. You're clearly tracking the lecture. Gold star for you. The more unstable the, the conditions, the hotter, the colder, more air circulation, the more quickly the virus is disrupted and becomes less infectious. Okay. Um, the one thing I want to do, and I do in all my talks, is I pause um, and acknowledge the work of Dr. Li Wenliang, which I'm, I, I always mispronounce his name. He was the doctor who first identified and raised the alarm about COVID-19. He was an ophthalmologist in Wuhan, China, and he posted about it to message boards to other ophthalmologists, which is what started um, the alarm and really the whole global system that got set into place to try to control the virus. If he hadn't done that, millions of more people would have died. Um, Initially, the government tried to shut him down and he was actually arrested and forced to sign documentation saying he was spreading false rumors. Um, he tried really hard to get personal protective equipment for his staff who were, you know, at ground zero in the pandemic when it first exploded in Wuhan, China. He did not get the protection that he needed. Um, as a result, he actually died from COVID-19 in February 7, 2020. He was 33 years old. Um, his wife was pregnant at the time, so he has a daughter that never met him. Um, and so I always, in all of my talks, I just want to acknowledge him because I think what he did was incredibly brave. And because of him, millions of lives were saved. And so it's worth remembering who he was and what he stood for as an individual. Um, and I always just try to bring that into all of my talks when we talk about this, is that there's, there was good people and continue to be good people that make sacrifices for all of us. And he was one of the first, and he did it at great um, personal cost. There was such an outcry from um, the people of China that they have since uh, uh, rescinded that documentation. They now acknowledge that he's a hero, he's remembered, and his role with controlling the pandemic is recognized. But it really took the people of China standing up and fighting for him to make that happen. Um, okay, I had questions about drug treatment for COVID-19. Um, I think I'm going to skip over those and go to the vaccine. And then if people want, I'll come back and talk about the drug treatment, if that's okay. Because I, I know that the bulk of what we want to talk about is the vaccine, which starts here. Okay. Um, so we have a set of things that protect us from being infected. Right? This is why we're not dying of an infection every three seconds. We've got physical barriers. We've got our innate immune response, which is kind of like uh, your constant surveillance system that's on all the time. And then you've got your adaptive immune response, which are like your super specialized uh, ninja, special ops, whatever metaphor you want to use aspect of your immune system. These guys are really specific. They develop to identify a very specific part of a specific pathogen and kill that specific pathogen and only that pathogen, um, which is why they're called our adaptive immune response, because they adapt to whatever the fight is. So the way this works is when you get infected, the first thing that gets turned on is your innate immune system. Most of the time, this is enough. You don't get an infection. It's why you can have a cut on your hand and you get better and nothing gets infected. Your innate immune response has, has control that infection. If your innate immune response is not enough, then your adaptive immune response gets turned on. These are going to be your B and T cells that I'm going to talk about. These are your specialized fighters, super highly trained, really great at killing the particular pathogen. When that control happens, a few of those cells become memory cells and your body keeps them around just in case you see the same bad guy again. And those memory cells are the basis of every vaccine that you've ever been given in your life. So the adaptive immune response has T cells and B cells. T cells are really good at killing things that are inside our cells. B cells are really good at killing things that live in us but outside of our cells. Like viruses that are trying to invade our cells. And what B cells can do is they can make antibodies, this term that you keep hearing about antibodies. Those are made by B cells. And so what can antibodies do? They can clump together the bad guys so they're easier to clean up. They can tag the bad guys and be like, hey, right, because our immune cells don't have eyes, right? So they have a chemical tag that says, this is the bad guy. Someone should kill him and eat him. 
And most importantly to SARS-CoV-2 is they can neutralize the bad guys. They can bind to the outside of a virus, stop its key from getting in the lock. And this is what the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine is doing. Whatever vaccine that you're talking about, what it's doing is neutralizing the virus. Antibodies are gonna bind to it and stop it from being able to get into our cells in the first place. So you have your B cell response in your primary infection. You get infected with something, you make a bunch of B cells and antibodies. Once you've controlled that infection, most of those B cells are gonna die. But a few specific B cells are gonna become memory B cells. And they're gonna remember the bad guy that they fought. And because they remember the bad guy that they fought, they're gonna respond faster and stronger the next time you see that bad guy. So B cells, memory B cells, are really long lived. They can live for decades, not forever. So sometimes you need a booster, but for a really long time. Normally in the first time that you see a bad guy, it can take weeks to turn on your B cell response. A memory B cell response can happen way faster, within days. So this is what your vaccines are doing. So if this is the amount of antibody that's getting made, the first time you see a bad guy, you're gonna see that antibody response come up, right? It takes a certain amount of time. The second time you see the same bad guy, your memory B cells are on it. They're gonna be faster and stronger. They're gonna make, start making antibodies way quicker and at a much higher level. This is why vaccines work, because what they're doing is making memory B cells. And what they're allowing us to do is skip the part where we actually get infected. So what a vaccine is saying is saying, okay, we don't actually wanna take the risk of you getting infected. We're gonna fake out your body so it thinks it's infected, so it makes the memory B cells. So then when you see the actual bad guy, you do this response over here. So when you have a vaccine and you're like, oh, I feel achy or oh, it hurts or oh, yeah, that's a good thing, that's us eliciting your immune response. That is your body thinking that there's a bad guy present, making an immune response and making memory B cells. If we don't fake out your system, your body will never make the memory B cells. Basically what we're doing in an immunization is a pretend first infection. Where normally you get infected, we know if you get infected, you're protected, where'd my, you get infected, you make memory B cells, and then you become, then you can be protected from them. But you have to be infected. And what basically scientists were like, hey, that really sucks. We don't want everyone to actually get infected. Let's make a fake infection that still generates the memory B cells. And the goal is to vaccinate enough people so that we get herd immunity. This is how herd immunity works. So the black dots are infected people. The blue dots are unvaccinated. The yellow dots are vaccinated. So if no one's vaccinated, then whatever the virus is, is going to spread super quickly. 25% of people vaccinated, it spreads more slowly. 50% of people vaccinated still spreads, but more slowly. 75% of people vaccinated still spreads, but more slowly. But look what happens when 90% are vaccinated or 95% are vaccinated. You're not really seeing virus transmission. A few individuals, a cluster of people are getting infected, but you're not getting this massive spread. So the idea with herd immunity is we vaccinate enough people, generate enough memory B cells in those people, so that now so many people cannot get that virus that the few individuals who do get the virus, who aren't vaccinated, can't get vaccinated, or too young, have pre-existing conditions, are protected because the herd is protected. I like this little gift because it very like intuitively explains the idea of herd immunity. Okay, so memory B cells basically are creating antibodies that bind to the key to neutralize the virus so it can't get into our cells. Okay, so how does an RNA vaccine work? We have this library of recipes, that's our DNA, that we have the genes, and then we make our RNA, and then we make our protein. We take our library of recipes, our body has the recipe book, the recipe, and then we make the actual thing. What we're doing when we do an mRNA vaccine is we're ignoring the library of recipes. We're ignoring the genes. 
And what we're saying is we're going to put in a recipe for the virus, but not the whole virus. We're not even doing the whole recipe. We're just taking a single ingredient, just the spike proteins. And we're saying make that. So an mRNA vaccine is the RNA recipe for just the spike proteins, just the keys. There's no genome, there's no capsid, there's no lipid membrane. It is not possible to get infected if it's just the spike protein. It's like asking me if I can make a car when all I've, you've given me is a wheel. I don't have the other parts of the car. I don't have the engine. I can't make the car run. What an mRNA vaccine is doing is putting that RNA into our cells. Our cells are making that spike protein and then our body is going, oh my God, there's a bad guy, spike protein. Let me make B cells and antibodies that are specific to the spike protein. And then we're getting our memory B cells. Now, what happens to that foreign RNA that we've put into our cells temporarily? Well, our bodies are making RNA all the time, right? We have that library of Congress, we make RNA, we make the proteins that we need for our cells to grow. So our bodies have a system where that RNA is constantly getting swept up and put it in the trash. We have garbage men in all of our cells, enzymes, that are designed to take RNA and destroy it. Because otherwise our cells would just fill up with the RNA, right? It would just be pieces of paper with recipes on it and recipes on it and recipes on it. Within all of our cells, as part of our normal biology, we have these garbage men that come through and take the RNA away. How quickly do they work? Our RNA in a single cell, on average, once you write down that recipe book, sticks around for two minutes. That's how effective that RNA cleanup team is. So when you ask me, what are the chances of an RNA vaccine getting to my ovaries and affecting my fertility or changing my DNA? I'm gonna say two minutes, also it's RNA. Also it's just the spike protein. What are the chances that I could build a car if, you've just get, if I just have a tire? They're about the same. How likely is it for me to build a car with a tire? That's about as likely as it is for your body to build a virus when someone's just given it the spike protein. And it gets cleared out of your system really quickly. Your body isn't making the spike protein for days or weeks or months. It's making it for a really small window of time, just enough to get those B cells going so that you build that memory response. In fact, it's so bad at eliciting that memory response and it gets cleaned up so quickly that we have to give you two shots. We have to do it twice because the first time the garbage men come through and clean it up so quickly that we don't generate enough memory B cells, which is why you need the booster. There's a bunch of vaccines out there. Pfizer and Moderna are the two most common ones. They're both pretty equally effective they're made the same way. They're mRNA vaccines to the spike protein. mRNA is really unstable. It has to be refrigerated at minus 80 or minus 20, which is part of what's been slowing down the rollout of the vaccine. Because there aren't that many places that have freezers that go to minus 80. And once the vaccine is thawed, it has to be put into people within the next few hours. Otherwise, the mRNA degrades. That's how delicate it is which should also tell you something about how long this idea of how long will it last in my body. You're talking about something that if left at room temperature degrades within a couple of hours. It degrades within your body within minutes. The other question I get is, is it really safe because it was made so quickly? It wasn't made that quickly. We've been researching mRNA vaccines for decades, going back all the way to 1990. And in fact, we had an mRNA vaccine that was approved and ready to go for SARS-CoV-1. We just didn't end up needing it because we managed to contain that virus in that pandemic. So you'll have this slide, you guys can look at the timeline, but it's not a recent thing. mRNA vaccines and the idea of inserting mRNA as a way to temporarily get our body to make things and fix things has been around for close to 50 years. And as recently as 2013, there were medicinal products that were getting FDA approval that were mRNA based. So this is not a recent discovery, which is why, thankfully, we were able to move as quickly as we could. That's one question. The other question I get is why did the vaccine take so long? And the answer to that question is even though we had the tech for it, we needed to make sure that it was safe 
And so we had to run it through the full clinical trials, which means that it went through a safety procedure. And then we had to produce it. So when you're producing a vaccine, you have to build a factory for that specific vaccine, which takes time. And then whatever comes out of that factory has to be safety tested, which takes time. Then it has to be packaged in a sterile manner. And in this case, the whole shipping procedure has to maintain it at minus 80 degrees. So imagine the trucks and the freezers and the movement of something that has to be maintained at minus 80 degrees Celsius. Then it has to be distributed. And at that point, the vaccination can begin, which is why we're seeing the rollout of the vaccine just now and not a year from now. What should you do after you're vaccinated? Should you wear your mask? And I thought this tweet summarized it perfectly. What's the first thing you're going to do when you get your vaccine shot? Nothing, because you're not fully protected. You're going to go home. You're going to wait a month. You're going to get your second shot. You're going to go home again and wait 14 days. What are you waiting for? Memory B cells. And then even after that, you're going to keep wearing your mask and you keep socially distancing, because what the vaccine protects you from is dying from COVID-19, severe COVID-19. There is some evidence that you could still potentially get COVID-19 at a very low level or mild level. That data is still coming through. And so to keep your community safe, you still need to wear a mask even after you're vaccinated because we still don't fully know how good it is. And now we've got these other variants out there. And while we're starting to get the data in about how effective these vaccines are, are against the variants, there's more and more variants developing. So even if you get vaccinated, you still need to wear your mask and you still need to socially distance until we get to the point where we have herd immunity and we've severely limited transmission and transmission of these different variants, the mask wearing and the socially distanced thing is not going to go away. I'm sad to say. There were some specific questions about fertility and so I looked them up. The only literature that I could find about fertility was about COVID-19 infection reducing sperm viability in men. There's nothing about the vaccine having any impact on the fertility of men or women. And the data on pregnant women is still mixed. And so the United States has chosen to say, if you're pregnant, you can decide whether or not you want to get the vaccine. The UK and the European Union has said, because we don't have data to prove that it's safe, we're not going to let pregnant women get vaccinated. So there's two approaches, but it's the same set of data, which is basically we don't have the data yet. We can't tell you one way or another. What is clear is if you're pregnant and you get severe COVID-19, it can lead to the death of the mother and the fetus. So for sure, getting sick is dangerous. In terms of the vaccine and itself being safe, I would just compare it to the illness. Over 100 million people globally have gotten COVID-19. Two million people have died. To date, as of last week, 100 million people have received COVID-19 vaccines. None of them have died. There is a 0.001% chance of having an allergic reaction to the vaccine. None of those allergic reactions have been severe enough to cause death or long-lasting damage or harm. So for me personally, I'm going to get vaccinated as soon as I can. Both my parents have been vaccinated. I push for everyone that can get access to it to get vaccinated. If you want specific recommendations, because there were some questions that were the kinds of things that your doctor should answer and not your professor, I would suggest going to the CDC website. And then there's a really great uh, University of Chicago website that breaks down some of the common things that are out there about what the vaccine is doing to you. At the end of the day, an mRNA vaccine is going to get degraded so quickly that the chances of it impacting any other part of your body other than where it was put are near impossible, which is why it went through the safety testing so quickly. The other kinds of vaccines that you have, like when you had your measles vaccine or your polio vaccine, those were not mRNA vaccines. And so the risks of an allergic reaction or other complications was actually significantly higher. Those garbage men that come through and clear out the mRNA in your cells are really effective and clean out the mRNA vaccine really quickly as well. And then I'll just end with love because I think ultimately we're a community and we need to get through this as a community and we need to behave as if we're part of a community. No one individual is going to be able to stay safe. It's really as a community that we keep each other safe and get each other through the pandemic. Wow. You did a great job covering a lot of the questions that we submitted ahead of time. So open it up to one or two questions. I'm honestly happy to stay and answer questions for as long as people have them. This is important to me. And I'm going to start. 
is it recommended that a person that's had a heart transplant, liver or kidney transplant receive the vaccine? And if so, what are the long-term effects, if any, on those, on these organs? So in terms of effect on organs, there's none because it's staying localized to the cells at the injection site and then getting cleared out. In terms of what's recommended for people that have transplants, I couldn't find anything specifically in the literature, the scientific literature. And this is one of those questions where I will quote my, <laughs> what my brother tells me all the time, which is that you're a doctor, but you're not that kind of doctor. And I would recommend that that individual talk to a medical professional because that's a little bit beyond the level of specificity that I feel comfortable speaking to. And my access and understanding has to do with the research side of things and not the actual diagnostic medical side of things. I have a question. Go ahead. The newest vaccine is by Johnson and Johnson and it only needs one shot. And then Moderna and Pfizer are two shot vaccines. My mother-in-law wants to wait for the Johnson & Johnson. How is that one different than the others? My understanding is the Johnson & Johnson is not an mRNA vaccine. So it's a, what's called a subunit vaccine. So it's the actual spike protein, not the instructions for your body to then make the spike protein. So it's the key, the little purple key, not the instructions for making the purple key. What data there is out there is that the Johnson Johnson vaccine is actually not as effective at protecting against the new variants that have come out of the UK and Australia as the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine. Honestly, if you have access to any vaccine, you should be getting your Tukas vaccinated. You can get two vaccines. You could go and get the Johnson and Johnson after. If you have access to a vaccine now, my recommendation is to get vaccinated now. These new variants that are coming out thankfully haven't been worse at causing disease, but their ability to get into our cells is so much stronger that it's a real risk. And the people that are passing away from these variants are the people that are highest risk. And the communities that are highest risk are, are, are essential workers. We've had, I think the numbers are one out of every thousand black Americans have died from COVID-19, but one out of every 1500 white Americans has died. Could you repeat that statistic? One out of every thousand black Americans has died. And I believe it's either 1500 or 1300 of one out of every white Americans has died. And the other, our other Latinx community and Asian and immigrant communities are fairly similar to black Americans. And the reason those communities are hardest hit is because they're more likely to be essential workers. They're less likely to have access to health insurance and access to the vaccines. And so they're the highest risk at passing away from COVID-19. You know what? The data I saw from Sacramento suggests that they get it more because they're so exposed, but they don't die at the same rate as Black Americans. We die more than Latinos. Yeah, but part of what's causing the deaths is the historical lack of access is what the data is suggesting. We're talking about lifetime and generations of not having access to healthcare and means, and that's playing out with COVID-19. That's a whole other lecture. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Why and how do the therapeutics work? Hydroxychloroquine doesn't work at all. There's zero evidence for that. There was a global 500,000 person studies that were done completely doesn't work. Remdesivir doesn't work at all for uh, severe COVID-19. It does seem to work a little bit for mild COVID-19 and it reduces illness from like 15 days to 11 days. The thing that seems to be working the best is actually steroids and particular st classes of steroids because the thing that's causing severe illness is our own immune response and steroids can shut down our immune response. That's the treatment that's being given for severe COVID-19 and that has really reduced mortality by 30 to 50% in different situations. Is that basically because it's reducing inflammation in the yes. lungs? You also get a gold star, my friend. I have a question. Uh, my sister had COVID, ended up in the hospital in Arizona. That was about three weeks ago. And she's 70 and she's already back to work. Still is recovering, she said, but she, she's not positive. So it's a little confusing to me. I'm going to go visit her in a week. And so I'm just wondering is there anything I need to worry about? 
We know that people that have pretty severe COVID-19 seem to generate their memory B cells and be, have some level of protection. The data is kind of still coming in on how much, but it seems to be relative to how sick you get. So if you have a really mild case, it's kind of, I mean, it kind of intuitively makes sense, right? Like if you have mm -hmm. mild illness, you don't wake up your immune system the same way. And so you don't make the same amount of memory B cells. If you have more severe illness, you make better memory B cells. Your sister's symptoms are probably the long-term effects of the damage that was done while she had the virus in her. So she would be testing negative for the virus, but her body still has the damage that was done, right? I was going to say like, if, a, if, a, if you had 12 toddlers in your home hyped up on sugar, even after the toddlers left, your home would still be a hot mess. It's like after you kill the virus, the hot mess remains, sometimes permanently. Yeah, I would, I would say the risk is to you and not to her, and it's with travel. Can you hear me, question? Yes, uh -huh. please, go where, ahead. Where can I purchase that N95 mask? I don't know. There's a lot of fake masks that are being sold on Amazon. The N95s have been hard to come yeah. by, in part because priority is being given to healthcare professionals. Surgical masks are not hard to come by, and they're almost as effective as N95s, right? 95 to 98%, assuming well, that you wear them properly. And, and those are I being sold there? everywhere. Oh, okay. Well, what about Costco? Would you uh, recommend Costco? They got a bunch of them. Yeah, Costco has surgical masks, yes. Oh, okay. And then I'm seeing K95s. K95s are actually not very effective at all. They're less effective than a surgical mask. And then N99 masks for dust are actually also not as effective as surgical masks. It has to do with the weave. We're trying to stop something really tiny. So if the weave is more loose, bigger things are going to be able to get through. Or if there's a vent that allows bigger things to get through, then you're not as protected. Well, is it the vent because it has a carbon filter and they claim it keeps out 99% of particles and virus? Yeah, but it still lets 1% through. And the, the carbon filter doesn't necessarily, a carbon filter versus a cloth filter isn't any different in terms of the virus. There's a lot of different things out there. I always just go back to say surgical masks work. They're sold everywhere. You can afford them and you can use them disposably. That's probably your safest, most consistent option. The other types of masks, the data is mixed for. It depends on the supplier and where it's coming from and how it's made. And it becomes harder for me to tell you what the most recent data is about it. But surgical masks, I'm confident on. I can give you the numbers. They consistently work. There was an article on the news today where they took the surgical mask and knotted it and then put that on. And then they put a mask, a cloth mask on top of that. Yeah, that works. That's definitely, with the new variants, that's what they're recommending. The reason they're recommending that is not because the surgical mask is worse or better at filtration. It's about those gaps around the surgical mask when you're wearing it. It's about the seal around your face. And that's what the N95 mask does, is it seals completely around your face. So the reason they're recommending putting a cloth mask over it is to increase the pressure so that it creates a tighter seal around your face. It's not about the extra layers of filtration. One more question. Yes. For the new variants, I know that there's not a lot known about them. Are the r nots for the new variants, are they much different than they are for the original variant that came in a year ago? And if so, will that cause the virus to spread a lot quicker? Yes, the new variants are, are spreading more quickly and that is the concern about them. And, and the infectious dose is lower. It takes less of them to infect people. Would the vaccination help us with the new variants? The, so far, the variants that have been tested. So there's been five new variants, I think, identified. Three have been tested. So far, Pfizer and Moderna protect against all three. They're doing the testing on the other two. They're anticipating more and more variants are going to be discovered. Part of the problem is that in the U.S. is we weren't doing genome surveillance, so we don't know what variants that we have. That was not something our federal government invested in until a month ago, January 20th. The other part of that issue is that we have such a high rate of transmission happening within the United States. It, that creates a situation where we're getting a lot of mutations. As we vaccinate and transmission slows down, that's going to slow down the generation of variants and the mutations that are happening. Doctor, would you be willing to come back and answer some more questions? <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. Because it's apparent that uh, we have a lot of questions and the information is really, really good.
And so if you wouldn't mind, uh, we would love for you to come back. My profound apologies for getting in late. But it, it seems like you have actually given our people and other people as well the much needed information in terms of their questions and curiosity with reference to this new lifestyle that we have to adapt to. So yeah. would you all want her to come back for a, a part two so that we can light up some more questions? Yes, that would okay. be awesome. <laughs> Okay, so yes. let's do this. Yes. We're going to line up some more questions, but you got to get your questions in early so that we can get them to the professor, get them to the doctor, so that she can do what she does so well, which is present well, scientific, proven information so we're not all over the place with the news media <laughs> up and down with all of this. Uh, crap that we uh, are taking in without having hard facts. I didn't say any bad words. Why do you get to say bad words? Well, well, you I made it through my whole presentation. I didn't say one bad word. Well, 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 we'll, we'll talk about that <laughs> later, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but listen, I, I want to say thank you a thousand times over uh, your willingness to uh, be present with us and to share with us uh, such incredible information. And uh, the part that I got was just incredible, uh, which was about only 30 minutes of it, but it was well worth it. So I'd like to have another go around with your expertise. All right? Sure, be happy to. And people have my contact information. You have the link to the slides and the talk was recorded. So I hope you, you share it and disseminate the information because that's how we keep each other safe. Each person we educate and then passes that on is one extra layer of protection, like a metaphorical mask around us. 